Mr. Lambrinidis, thank you very much for having us here today. Um, I would like to begin with the greater challenges that the EU faces on the human rights policy, on its foreign policy. You have been in the position of the Special Representative for Human Rights since 2012. What do you think are the greatest challenges that the EU has to face, has to address with its foreign policy? <laughs> that's, 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 a small that's a small question. Uh, I would say I would say that we have to face challenges um, uh, outside the EU mostly, but we also have to face some challenges internally in how we do our foreign policy and human rights. Um, the world has gotten to be a worse place uh, when it comes to human rights, at least human rights narratives in the past few years, and that is our biggest challenge. Some countries that are ideologically or politically committed against human rights have become much more aggressive in trying to export the bad narratives and practices to the regions, trying to um, bend the will of the people to the will of uh, strong men, uh, you know, populists in their countries. And, uh, and this is a big challenge because they're trying to basically convince us that human rights uh, are either desperate uh, or unpopular uh, or Western uh, and therefore should not be applied. So this is fundamentally a way that they're trying to, to use and we have to address this and we do, and we do. We are promoting positive narratives on human rights and we are being much more on the offensive without being offensive when it comes to these people. Uh, we have major challenges when it comes to wars. Some wars are terrible. Some wars are spilling over not just uh, the, uh, the obvious uh, right to life that is being violated by, by the you know, hundreds of thousands of deaths, but also um, issues of uh, other human rights. In fact, we have found that if you look at every bloody conflict in the world today, you will see that at the roots of the conflict was probably a human rights violation, a serious one that was not addressed on time. And of course, there are thematic challenges. Uh, improving women's rights around the world, uh, dealing with religious uh, fanaticism and the freedom of religion and, and belief, uh, protecting freedom of expression, freedom of speech, uh, defending the multilateral human rights system, the United Nations, regional organizations that do human rights, which for us is a very big priority. Um, uh, so uh, economic, social, cultural rights, ensuring that poverty gets eliminated. All these issues are not separate from each other, but intertwine, and that is where the challenge internally comes. We also here in the European Union have become much more effective in streamlining human rights in our policy. It's not always that obvious. We have 150 delegations around the world, embassies, EU embassies, and all of them produce a human rights report every year for their countries. That is an indication of a priority we place on human rights that I think is virtually unparalleled around the world. They, uh, they send their recommendations back, we act accordingly. We have a number of commissioners at the European Commission that deal with issues that touch on human rights, development, if you like, neighborhood policy, many other things. Of course, Federica Mogherini, who leans, leads this effort here. So um, that kind of streamlining has been our challenge internally, and I think that we are much better now than we were six years ago. So the 10th of December is the day dedicating to human rights. Uh, this year also coincides with the 50th, 70th sorry, anniversary of the Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights. Um, currently, we see that human rights are challenged globally and they are challenged by religious practices and authoritarian regimes and maybe sometimes cultural uh, customs as well. Uh, in this regard, what should the national actors and international actors to do in order to make the situation better and what they used to do in order to maintain and upkeep the effectiveness of the Declaration of Human Rights. I think the, the fundamental thing that we have to do is to remember that human rights are law, international law, but they're more than that. They are human dignity. That's what human rights are based on. We all are human beings. We're not animals. You may not like me. Uh, I may not be like you but you may not kick me because you don't like me, you may not imprison me, you may not kill me, you may not discriminate against me. That fundamental human principle exists in every culture, in every religion, in every region of the world, in every political system. So we have to take the debate back. This is universal. It's universal. The second thing we have to do, and we are doing, is make sure that every time there are egregious human rights violations, we're not afraid to speak up as European Union, as member states, as United Nations. Many, many authoritarian governments 
would like you to simply not talk about the violations. They're trying everything they can. And the moment they call me up to tell me, don't you dare make a statement, I know that what I have to do at that moment is make a statement. Because that is the one thing between them and total impunity. And the final thing we have to do, and we are doing, is not allow the bad guys to hijack the debate. There are tens of countries around the world as we speak who believe in human rights, have ownership of human rights, and who are applying human rights-based policies to address major challenges such as security and counterterrorism, such as uh, building sustainable development, such as building peaceful societies. We launched in New York in September the so-called Good Human Rights Stories with 13 countries around the world and the European Union. These countries presented each one of them a concrete policy example of how they pursue government priorities through human rights. And by being in the same room at the same time, they highlighted how all over the world, from all regions, human rights are universal and human rights work. In countries such as Peru, poverty has fallen from about 57% 70 years ago to only 22% today. And it was done not by repressing anyone, not to ha by having a central government policy that tells you you can work here but not there, but by a commission that included government, civil society, independent ombudsmen. They were successful through human rights. In Georgia, torture was the highest, one of the highest in the world in 2011. It's almost zero today in very few years. They applied human rights policies and they are telling us that they are pursuing security not through torture. They can bring security in the country through respecting rights. And these examples are examples that anyone else in the world, any other country who wishes to address challenges like those, may do so. So we are not perfect in human rights. No one is. No one is. The litmus test in human rights is not perfection. The litmus test in human rights is, do you have the institutions in place that do not allow you to shove your imperfections under the carpet? In other words, do you want to be better than you are? There are countries around the world who say that we should not be talking about human rights because we violate them as well, and of course everyone does. But if you look at those countries, they do not have independent courts, they do not have independent parliaments, they don't have an independent press, they have a civil society that they don't talk to, but they usually repress. So every check and balance for them to be better at human rights is not there. In Europe, every one of these things are there. So we're not perfect, but we're trying to be better. Mr. Lambrinidis, let's discuss now another important issue of human rights violation, let's say. It's, it's one of the biggest humanitarian crises currently, and I'm referring to the Rohingya crisis in Myanmar. In October, the EU mission in Myanmar assessed the situation on human and labor rights in the country and actually they used thinking to revoke the free trade deal, um, the tariff, the free tariff trade deal that it has with the country. And we wonder if you think that this is an effective way to deal with the situation of the, of the Rohingya crisis in the country or we should do more in order to help these people that they face discrimination and genocide from the government of Myanmar. Well, we should do things. Um, and we are examining all the possibilities now for a long time. I have been in the country five times in the past five years. Uh, I've met with uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. I met with uh, the previous government. I met with uh, the, the head of the military. Uh, I've met with civil society. I've met with religious leaders. I have uh, dedicated a big part of the European Union's effort in trying to resolve this crisis. Myanmar had a number of human rights problems under dictatorship and uh, moving to a democracy was one of the big successes of the country. But what happened to the Rohingya in the process, this big black hole of rights, um, uh, is, uh, is despicable. Uh, and um, uh, what it is that the government and the military can and must do has been discussed extensively. There have been United Nations commissions that the European Union is supporting. We are the biggest donor in Bangladesh, is ensuring that the refugee, the refu refugees are, uh, c can live as, in a, as much dignity as possible. We have been uh, working with the government and pushing the government to create the conditions for a voluntary and dignified return. And we have explained to the government that that means defending the human rights of the Rohingyas, ensuring that everything from their citizenship to their uh, to eliminating and punishing hate speech against them, 
uh, to ensuring that uh, they can return to the place from which they live and are not thrown to a different part of the Rakhine state that they had no connection with, emotional or livelihood-wise, um, that all these are issues that need to be addressed. Uh, so we are very much um, engaged in the country, and of course we are examining as well uh, a number of other uh, options that we have in our hands, uh, whether it is economic options, uh, dealing with the government and the military, uh, or whether it is sanctions. Uh, already we have sanctioned uh, a number of military commanders in the country that we have determined uh, have been involved in, uh, in violations. We have an arms embargo against uh, against uh, the country so we none of our states uh, sell arms to uh, to uh, Myanmar uh, and um, uh, so I assure you we're very vigilant globally we see that human rights defenders and NGOs face severe violations on their rights and sometimes arbitrary prosecution and we wonder how is the European Union is engaging with the countries where these kind of violations are recorded and what mechanisms do the EU has in order to effectively deal with the situation there and if there is anything else that the EU and EU nations can do in order to improve the situation for human rights defenders and NGOs? It's a very important question because the shrinking space of civil society uh, has been a, a big challenge in the past few years, one of the biggest. And the reason it is a, a, a real issue is because unless human rights become the ownership of the people in every country, they will never really take long-term roots in the country. We know that, which is why we support civil society, and repressive governments know that as well, which is why they repress civil society, because they do not want human rights to really reach the people. They don't want it to become part of the country's culture. So we use financial means, we use political means, uh, and we do both external and internal policies in order to support them, uh, support human rights defenders, support civil society. We have the biggest fund to support economically civil society all over the world, the European Instrument in Democracy of Human Rights. We do not tell civil society what to do. They have their priorities all over the world. We support them economically uh, in order to be able to have them do their work. Uh, we politically support them by ensuring that whenever we visit any country we meet with civil society at the exact same level that we meet with governments. In our human rights dialogues with over 40 countries around the world every year, we have increased the presence of civil society and civil society seminars where we bring governments and civil society together before the two governments officially speak during the dialogue. In some instances, human rights activists tell us that they have not had the chance to speak to their own government other than the opportunity that we gave them through those interactions. We um, support the United Nations work uh, uh, forcefully. Uh, both the special rapporteurs on human rights defenders, for example, uh, on freedom of association, um, and we make sure in every country that we go that we uh, encourage, um, and as strongly as we can, that they engage with the United Nations system. And of course, if you look at our domestic policy documents, you will find it perhaps remarkable that the biggest foreign policy and economic policy priorities of the European Union list civil society as key actors of engagement for us in those documents. If you look at the European Consensus for Development, the big document that everyone approved on how we apply the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals around the world, how we eliminate poverty, you will see numerous references to human rights and civil society. And I encourage you to look at other countries around the world and tell me if you will see the same kind of commitment. I assure you, you won't. The global strategy that Federica Mogherini announced a couple of years ago, the compass uh, of our foreign policy engagement includes civil society in it. Um, and finally, let me say, some civil society activists, as we're making all these discussions, are in danger for their lives or are being thrown in jail because a government simply doesn't like what they're saying, not because of any bad thing they've done. Those civil society activists know that we have in place programs to protect them, to fund their lawyers, to protect their families in some terrible instances, to take them out of dangerous way if we can, um, uh, to build with governments in some countries that are willing to do so, 
uh, human rights protection prevention mechanisms to ensure that they never reach the point of danger to begin with. You asked a simple question and you're getting a complicated answer and the reason you're getting that is because human rights is not easy. Uh, Mr. Albrinidis, the European Union proposes a very attractive trade deals to countries where human rights violations occur in order to, to improve the situation of human rights there. On the one hand, and on the other hand, we have the Dutch proposal that puts forward sanctions targeted on individuals that violate human rights. And what do you think, which approach of these two do you think uh, is more effective for the EU in order to safeguard the human rights globally? Well, the Dutch proposal you mentioned is, is one that is being under discussion as we speak. And I'm very pleased that there was a reflection meeting uh, in uh, re recently um, with experts from all over Europe. I think that's an important discussion to have uh, for our member states. Uh, but that does not mean that we don't already have in place uh, both regional uh, uh, geographic specific sanctions in the EU or instruments that we can exercise pressure through in order to bring human rights improvements. So if you take most recently the cases of Myanmar that I mentioned to you and Venezuela, you see that the EU has applied specific human rights related sanctions in those countries. And that requires, of course, the unanimity of member states. Uh, but uh, but uh, we, have been, uh, we have been effective in doing so. You are very right in noting our trade agreements. Uh, until a few years back, we did not have what we have today, which is a mandatory human rights clause in those agreements, a central clause that major violation of human rights uh, you know, will affect the trade relationship. Something that many of our partners around the world don't know is that we have also this special tariff regime. It's called the GSP Plus, Generalized System of Preferences Plus. That fundamentally allows every country in the world that is under that scheme to import virtually all their goods in Europe with virtually zero tariffs. So you would think, well, what do the Europeans ask in return? What is the quid pro quo there? Are they asking for better access to oil and gas, as many people like, accuse us of, of doing around the world, of being self-interested? Are they asking, you know, to export more oranges as they import more tangerines or something? No. GSP Plus regime has only one requirement on the countries that is under it, and that is that that country signs, ratifies, and implements all United Nations and International Labor Organization conventions that have to do with human rights and labor rights. That's the one requirement. What we ask countries in order to be able to have the most privileged trade deal with us is be good in human rights and improve all the time. And when we see violations in that, as you very correctly point out, we send delegations, we look at those violations, we talk to the government, we talk to civil society and people, and we always try to calibrate what the best reaction for us is. But for us, as I said, human rights is not a luxury, it is a necessity. When we ask from countries around the world to apply it, it's because we know, not just from our own experiences, but from experiences all over the world, that open societies that respect rights always are, in the end, stronger, more resilient, more peaceful, more prosperous. And those who violate rights may for a short period of time appear to be okay, but in the end, collapse. If I may tell you, a few years back, because sometimes people say, oh, you know, human rights is a luxury. We're trying to fight terrorists. We're trying to, to bring security. Don't criticize us. Don't get human rights involved. And I'm, I was thinking, you know what, a few years back, we we're talking about economic development and not a single human being said sustainable development. And the reason we did, well, we, you know, because, and then we said, wait a second now. Yeah, maybe you can develop economically in the short term if you have child labor. Maybe you can develop if you have workers that you give no rights to. Maybe you can develop if you pollute your environment because all these things will make you produce cheaper goods. But is that the kind of development that the world wants? And then we said, there's no way, no way. This ends up destroying our societies. And then we came and said, sustainable development, sustainable. That became the key word. And now no one talks about development. Well, in the exact same way, the European Union says to the world that it's about time we bring the word sustainable be before the word security. 
You could bring security in your country if you arrest a few thousand people you don't like and throw them in jail and take them off the streets when they peacefully protest, give the impression that things are nicer and calmer. But all you're doing is you are creating resentment, taking away from your country the ability to improve itself through different points of views, potentially radicalizing people that eventually will become radical when they were not before. You can torture people to get the truth, but as the Netherlands showed us, or, or, or uh, the Netherlands, uh, as Norway showed us, as Georgia showed us, there's a way to interview and to get the truth out of suspects, even of the worst terrorist crimes, without torture, which is an absolute prohibi prohibited crime under international law. And if you torture your people, all you are doing is you are diminishing the pe your, your people's trust in your institutions. No one trusts the judiciary anymore, even for an entirely unrelated case, if they see that the judiciary basically accepts confessions of tortured people and doesn't make a peep about them. Sustainable security. These are big topics. Human rights is about the big and it's about the small. It's about addressing the fundamental root causes of war and insecurity and poverty. And it's also about addressing the specific immediate need of any particular human rights defender who may have protested against something another government wants them dead. It's both. And if we do both more effectively as Europe, I will be very proud. Thank you very much for this insightful exchange.